Dear friends in El Baha, knowing that the friends will be anxious to learn the details of the passing of our brother Thornton Chase, we hasten to send the following. Mr. Chase recently returned home from a business trip north, visiting San Francisco and Oakland, Portland, Seattle, and we think also Victoria and Vancouver. At all points where there were believers, special meetings were held and much good work done. While on this trip, we understood that he had two attacks of the trouble which cost him his life, being in the hospital twice. Thursday evening, the 26th, was the first most of us knew of his illness when, at a meeting at the home of Miss Clapp, it was announced that he was seriously ill and had been operated upon that day at Los Angeles Hospital. On Monday morning, word was received that Mr. Chase was very low. The friends prayed for him constantly, and about 11 o'clock, word came that he had rallied. We all hoped that a miracle would be performed and that he would be brought back to life and health, even though his life hung by a thread. On Sunday, telegrams were sent to various centers asking for the prayers of the friends. It was arranged that the friends here, as many as could, should assemble at Mr. Chase's home for a prayer service on Monday evening, September 30th. The sun had set when a little group of earnest souls, 20 in all, from various parts of Los Angeles, from Pasadena, Tropico, and Glendale, assembled in silence on a street corner amid the bustle and din of the metropolis to pray for the restoration of their brother to physical health and strength. About seven o'clock we reached the home and had hardly entered before the telephone rang and we were informed that Mr. Chase had just passed away. Every head was bowed as Mr. Rice Ray hung up the receiver and said, Friends, he has gone. O light divine, invisible, immeasurable light, eternal as divinity, impenetrably bright, the living universe bows down and veils its face before thee. All angels and archangels bend and happily adore thee. Speak thou to self and darkened souls. Command, let there be light. So shall eternal day appear to end chaotic night. The morning star shall sing again the anthem of creation. The sons of God shall shout for joy with new divine elation. Thy flame is love, the living fire. Thine alchemy divine transmutes man's spirit into life, the water into wine. Within thy crucible, O love, with thee this heart is blending its life outdrawn to be reborn from death to life unending. On Saturday, October 19th at 1 p.m., Abdul Baha and about 25 Baha'is of Los Angeles arrived at the cemetery, Inglewood. The place is charming. The meadows are green and there are many trees. Abdul Baha silently walked ahead of the friends and he was followed reverently by them. There are many flower beds and the fragrance thereof reached the nostrils. Most of the friends carried bouquets of flowers in their hands. After arriving at the grave, Abdul Baha scattered his flowers, and then one after another of the friends 
gave him their bouquets, and he divided them and scattered them over the grave. Then Abdul Baha, standing at the head of the grave and raising his hands towards heaven, uttered a prayer in Mr. Chase's honor. You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdul Baha in the West. Welcome to the podcast. At the top of the show, we featured the story of Thornton Chase. It was upon Abdul Baha's arrival in San Francisco he received the news that Thornton Chase had passed away. Mr. Chase was designated the first American Baha'i, declaring his faith in 1895. As the master said during his visit to Chase's grave, he served the cause faithfully, and his services will ever be remembered throughout future ages and cycles. Mr. Chase's life bore many trials and vicissitudes. Several days after he was born, his mother died. He also fought in the Civil War and had great difficulties throughout his life maintaining steady work. However, he was very patient during his long suffering and learned to appreciate the beauty of many religions. In 1894, while working in Chicago, Mr. Chase was informed by a friend about a man, Ibrahim Kirillah, who taught about Baha'u'llah, a messenger of God who fulfilled biblical prophecy. Mr. Chase continually spread the faith throughout the country but most notably played a significant role in the development of the administrative organization of the faith during its formative years in America. Let's continue now with the second segment of the show, a talk by Abdu'l-Baha on international peace, read by Ariana. 26 October 1912. Talk at the Assembly Hall, Hotel Sacramento. I have visited your capital and its gardens. No other capital has such beautiful surroundings. Just as it is imposing and distinguished above all others, so may the people of California become the most exalted and perfect altruists of the world. California is indeed a blessed country. The climate is temperate, the sun ever shining, the fruits abundant and delicious. All outer blessings are evident here. The Californians are a noble people. Therefore, I hope they may make extraordinary progress and become renowned for their virtues. The issue of paramount importance in the world today is international peace. The European continent is like an arsenal, a storehouse of explosives ready for ignition and one spark will set the whole of Europe aflame, particularly at this time when the Balkan question is before the world. Even now war is raging furiously in some places. The blood of innocent people is being shed, children are made captive, women are left without support and homes are being destroyed. Therefore, the greatest need in the world today is international peace. The time is ripe. It is time for the abolition of warfare, the unification of nations and governments. It is the time for love. It is the time for cementing together the East and the West. Inasmuch as the Californians seem peace-loving and possessed of great worthiness and capacity, I hope that advocates of peace may daily increase among them until the whole population shall stand for that beneficent outcome. May the men of affairs in this democracy uphold the standard of international conciliation. Then may altruistic aims and thoughts radiate from this center toward all other regions of the earth. And may the glory of this accomplishment forever halo the history of this country. May the first flag of international peace be upraised in this state. 
May the first illumination of reality shine gloriously upon this soil. May this center and capital become distinguished in all degrees of accomplishment. For the virtues of humanity and the possibilities of human advancement are boundless. There is no end to them. And whatever be the degree to which humanity may attain, there are always degrees beyond. There is no attainment in the contingent realm of which it may be said, beyond this state of being and perfection there is no other, or this has achieved the superlative degree. No matter how perfect it may appear, there is always a greater degree of attainment to be reached. Therefore, no matter how much humanity may advance, there are ever higher stations to be attained because virtues are unlimited. There is a consummation for everything except virtues. And although this country has achieved extraordinary progress, I hope that its attainment may be immeasurably greater, for the divine bounties are infinite and unlimited. There are some who believe that the divine bounties are subject to cessation. For example, they think that the revelation of God, the effulgence of God, and the bounties of God have ended. This is self-evidently a mistaken idea, for none of these is subject to termination. The reality of divinity is likened to the sun, and revelation is likened to the rays thereof. If we should assert that the bounties of God are not everlasting, we are forced to believe that divinity can come to an end, whereas the reality of divinity enfolds all virtues, and by reason of these, bounties is perfect. Were it not possessed of all these perfections or virtues, it could not be divinity. The sun is the sun because of its rays, light, and heat. If it could be dispossessed of them, it would not be the sun. Therefore, if we say that the divinity or sovereignty of God is accidental and subject to termination, we must perforce think that divinity itself is accidental, without foundation and not essential. God is the creator. The word creator presupposes or connotes creation. God is the provider. The word provider implies recipients of provision. Another name for the creator is the resuscitator, which demands the existence of creatures to be resuscitated. If he be not the provider, how could we conceive of creatures to receive his bounty? If he be not the Lord, how could we conceive of subjects? If he be not the knower, how could we conceive of those known? If we should say that there was a time in past ages when God was not possessed of his creation, or that there was a beginning for the world, it would be a denial of creation and the Creator. Or if we should declare that a time may come when there will be a cessation of divine bounties, we should virtually deny the existence of divinity. It is as though man should conceive of a king without country, army, treasury, and all that constitutes sovereignty or kingdom. Is it possible to conceive of such a sovereign? A king must be possessed of a dominion, an army, and all that pertains to sovereignty, in order that his sovereignty may be a reality. It is even so with the reality of divinity which enfolds all virtues. The sovereignty thereof is everlasting, and the creation thereof is without beginning and without end. Among the bounties of God is revelation. Hence, revelation is progressive and continuous. It never ceases. It is necessary that the reality of divinity, with all its perfections and attributes, should become resplendent in the human world. The reality of divinity is like an endless ocean. Revelation may be likened to the rain. Can you imagine the cessation of rain? 
Ever on the face of the earth, somewhere rain is pouring down. Briefly, the world of existence is progressive. It is subject to development and growth. Consider how great has been the progress in this radiant century. Civilization has unfolded, nations have developed, industrialism and jurisprudence have expanded, sciences, inventions, and discoveries have increased. All of these show that the world of existence is continually progressing and developing, and therefore, assuredly, the virtues characterizing the maturity of man must likewise expand and grow. The greatest bestowal of God to man is the capacity to attain human virtues. Therefore, the teachings of religion must be reformed and renewed because past teachings are not suitable for the present time. For example, the sciences of bygone centuries are not adequate for the present because sciences have undergone reform. The industrialism of the past will not ensure present efficiency because industrialism has advanced. The laws of the past are being superseded because they are not applicable to this time. All material conditions pertaining to the world of humanity have undergone reform, have achieved development, and the institutes of the past are not to be compared with those of this age. The laws and institutes of former governments cannot be current today for legislation must be in conformity with the needs and requirements of the body politic at this time. This has been the case also with the religious teachings, so long set forth in the temples and churches, because they were not based upon the fundamental principles of the religions of God. In other words, the foundation of the divine religions had become obscured, and non-essentials of form and ceremony were adhered to, that is, the kernel of religion had apparently disappeared and only the shell remained. Consequently, it was necessary that the fundamental basis of all religious teaching should be restored, that the sun of reality, which had set, should rise again, that the springtime, which had refreshed the arena of life in ages gone by, should appear anew, that the rain which had ceased should descend, that the breezes which had become stilled should blow once more. Therefore, Baha'u'llah appeared from the horizon of the Orient and re-established the essential foundation of the religious teachings of the world. The worn-out traditional beliefs current among men were removed. He caused fellowship and agreement to exist between the representatives of varying denominations so that love became manifest among the contending religions. He created a condition of harmony among hostile sects and upheld the banner of the oneness of the world of humanity. He established the foundation of for international peace, caused the hearts of nations to be cemented together and conferred new life upon the various peoples of the East. Among those who have followed the teachings of Baha'u'llah, no one says, I am a Persian, I am a Turk, I am a Frenchman, or I am an Englishman. No one says, I am a Muslim, upholding the only true religion. I am a Christian, loyal to my traditional and inherited beliefs. I am a Jew, following Talmudic interpretations. Or, I am a Zoroastrian, and opposed to all other religions. On the contrary, all have been rescued from religious, racial, political, and patriotic prejudices and are now associating in fellowship and love to the extent that if you should attend one of their meetings, you would be unable to observe any distinction between Christian and Muslim, Jew and Zoroastrian, Persian and Turk, Arab and European, for their meetings are based upon the essential foundations of religion and real unity has been established among them. Former antagonisms have passed away. The centuries of sectarian hatred are ended. The period of aversion has gone by. The medieval conditions of ignorance have ceased to exist. 
Barely the century of radiance has dawned. Minds are advancing, perceptions are broadening, realizations of human possibilities are becoming universal. Susceptibilities are developing, the discovery of realities is progressing. Therefore, it is necessary that we should cast aside all the prejudices of ignorance, discard superannuated beliefs and traditions of past ages, and raise aloft the banner of international agreement. Let us cooperate in love and through spiritual reciprocity enjoy eternal happiness and peace. Now to our roundtable discussion. Hey, I'm Mitch and I'm a musician. Hi, I'm Borna and I'm a computer scientist. Hi, I'm Anna and I work in film. In this tablet, I like that Abdu Baha is talking about that the revelation is like the rain and it's ceaseless and it never stops. But I mean, if you think about it, if, we're, if it's raining outside, we can do things that prevent us from like feeling the rain or feeling the sun. You know, we can walk with an umbrella. Mm -hmm. We can kind of put these barriers between us and the revelation or us and like this divine bounty, this, this feeling of our spirituality. Yeah, and it's kind of the same with what we're doing in the world right now. That we're just, in a way, going on about what we're doing and not really wondering or even looking at what is there around there for us. Like, if the rain is coming, are you actually going to enjoy it? Or are you going to kind of stay away from it and shy from it and say, okay, this is evil, I don't want it? I like how he talks about um, like the acquisition of virtue is sort of an endless process. Like, virtues actually don't cease. I guess I never really thought of it that way, or just, like, the idea of, of becoming perfect. If, if we should assert that the bounties of God are not everlasting, we are forced to believe that divinity can come to an end, whereas the reality of divinity enfolds all virtues, and our reason of these bounties is perfect. I think sometimes that we have to understand, like, when we look at ourselves and our path to spiritual progress and personal development, we have to, <coughs> with the understanding that there is no end to our acquisitions of virtues, that, or even once we acquire a certain virtue, it's perfection and it's constant refinement. But I think sometimes we do have to recognize, like, and encourage ourselves and recognize the things we have attained, you know, and then begin to understand, like, how you have to go forward, you know, when you're when you're building something, you can't just say, okay, here's the structure. I have to build the top, but then not really understand what the structure is. And it's beautiful, and you've done good things, I think. so. I like your point about, like, looking and encouraging ourselves at what we've achieved. Because there's always the, the, the like, the, I, I can't, like, people always look at themselves and see themselves as failures in a way. It's like, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that, I can't do this, I can't do that. But you always have to build from somewhere. And I mean, if you look at yourself, there's always plenty of good qualities and attributes within you. So if you start looking at those and then building on them, it might actually be easier and more constructive rather than saying, oh, I can't do this, or I can't do that. Yeah, Abdu'l-Bahá tells us, you know, we're constantly told to be encouraging and, and patient. And he doesn't just say with other people, mm -hmm. you know, we also have to be that way with ourselves. So how do we go about doing this? Like, because at the same time, I mean, we're trying to fight our ego and not, you know, boast ourselves and boost ourselves to the top and be like, yeah, I'm the best. So mm -hmm. there has to be that moderation and balance of I'm good, but I can always improve. Mm -hmm. and the understanding of how you became to. I think sometimes I know when I look at my family and we have generations of Baha'is and we say, OK, there's certain things that we've we've achieved in our lives, but what do we really owe that to? Where do these, like when somebody praises you for being kind, you can recognize that, yeah, you are a kind person, but where do you really, where does that kindness stem from? It stems from your understanding of the teachings and that you have to be kind, you have to be patient and loving and caring. I think it always helps to think of even like everything about you that's good, if you always think about that as what you're offering to humanity and not something that mm -hmm. you just possess then I think it becomes easier because then it's like even at like the more virtues you acquire or the like you know that you can become better, 
It's like you're not doing it for your own self-concept. So therefore, like you don't have to think about like, oh, what do I have? What do I not have? Mm -hmm. Because it's something that you're giving up and you're giving anyway. Its purpose is to use. So basically, like what you have is not of any use or I mean, unless you're using it to the service of humanity, Mm -hmm. it's kind of pointless to have it. Kind of. I mean, almost. I mean, just in the sense that, like, our whole reason for existence is to is to know God. Mm-hmm. And through that, like, w- the way that we do that is to serve humanity. So. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, imagine you're, like, the richest guy in the world, and you're just keeping that money. Yeah, and exactly. And not doing it anything. Like, what's the point? Yeah. Like, I don't know. And I think we have to look at our virtues in the same way and be like, okay, mm-hmm. if I'm patient, like... How can I use this patience mm-hmm. patience for others? Or yeah, how do you utilize your talents and your capabilities mm-hmm. in the appropriate way? You know, I can say I'm a musician, but then if I never perform or I never play, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just empty. <laughs> or even if you just sit at home and play alone, like no one is benefiting from it. Exactly. It's pleasant. I like the connection in this that he makes between the acquisition of virtues and um, progressive revelation. Like he starts talking about, um, uh, like he says, okay, the greatest bestowal of God to man is the capacity to attain human virtues. Therefore, the teachings of religion must be reformed and renewed because past teachings are not suitable for the present time. It's a very difficult thing. Imagine you've lived with something, you know, for hundreds of years and then all of a sudden it's 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 a sudden change of like no i mean a lot of people think that oh what i believed in wasn't valid of course it's valid because the progressive revelation means that okay it was suited for the time but it's still very hard to be like i have to you know change my beliefs and mm-hmm. if my fathers and forefathers believe in this why can't i do it mm-hmm. I mean, he's talking about it was necessary that the fundamental basis of all religious teaching should be restored. Hmm. But I don't know if that... I don't know if that would include or encompass the virtues. Hmm. Because on the other hand, I mean, a virtue isn't like the fundamental property of a religion. It's more what the believers show in their everyday life after following the teachings of the religion. Yeah. So, I mean, a a patient guy a thousand years ago obviously looked different than a patient guy looks like today. But I think the concept, I mean, obviously is the same. Yeah. It seems like there's something that that is eternal. Mm. I I think certain things are are eternal. But I think that the way that those virtues become manifest are definitely Mm. different. You know, if you're... If you are not prejudiced, you know, but somebody who's prejudiced today or not prejudiced today would be very different from somebody a thousand years ago Mm. when you didn't know that there was even somebody of a different color than you, you know, so how can you, but now we have the opportunity, our tests are a lot greater, but then our opportunity to show forth certain virtues is, is just huge compared to what it was thousands of years ago, Mm. hundreds of years ago. So he's talking about the need. This is 1912. He's talking about the greatest need in the world today is international peace. The time is ripe. It is time for the abolition of warfare, the unification of nations and governments. It is the time for love. It is time for cementing together the East and the West. It's 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're still looking at, you know, everything that's going on in the world today. It's very, I mean, you would say that his talks even today would be very, very poignant and accurate. It's almost as if they're timeless. <laughs> you know, if we look at this last hundred years, the things that have happened are just absolutely amazing in terms of the East and the West, you know, even just that concern for your fellow man or another country and another people. Now, if something happens in, in the East, the West knows of it within minutes, you know, and people are concerned and people do care about it. As opposed to 100 years ago, it would take quite some time mm. for 
the West to realize something was wrong with the East or the East to realize something was going on in the West and then people were more complacent and they didn't really have that that concern for other people. So I think though the process is is slow, the things that are happening, like the milestones in that process are absolutely beautiful and phenomenal. I think it's interesting when Bahá'u'lláh was talking about, when Abdu'l-Bahá was talking about since Bahá'u'lláh appeared that the worn out traditional beliefs current among men were removed and that, you know, he goes on to talk about how people are associating with so much more love and harmony based upon the essential foundations of religion and real unity has been established among them. It's like the way he, he perceives that, you know, it's like he's looking at that. But even now, sometimes I when I look at things, I don't really I don't have that perception of based upon the foundations of religion and real unity is being established like. It's kind of like, you know, Baha'u'llah uses the analogy of water and ice and that even if we look at water and it hasn't turned into ice yet, its possibility to turn into ice is already in the other the other realm. You know, it's already possible. It's already created in a way. So I think like sometimes when Baha'u'llah talks about unity, it's it's in the same way he's kind of looking at the water and saying it turned into ice. He's uni- looking at the disunity and seeing its inherent ability to be unified. I think... I guess it's kind of setting a goal or a target for us. It's like, instead of, I mean, he looks at reality in its truest form. So, and the true form of reality is not necessarily what we see right now. Because if he says the earth is one country and mankind its citizens, I mean, that is the reality, but we're not living by it. So it kind of sets a target for us to understand that, okay, this is what we're working towards to achieve. And I think that's the same when Abdul Baha is saying that, you know, I don't see myself as a Turk. I don't see myself as a Persian mm-hmm. or a Frenchman or a Jew or a Christian. It's it's working towards that goal that we understand that, okay, we should. Just his speaking about it creates the possibility of it in a way. He plants that idea, plants that seed. It's like Abdul Baha says he used to praise people for virtues and sometimes they didn't possess those virtues. <laughs> But when they heard about, oh, I'm humble and, you know, I'm kind, they'd begin to manifest those things in their, like, their their lives. And then they become like that. And I think he's kind of doing the same thing with humanity mm. on a larger scale. He's saying, oh, you're so unified and beautiful. <laughs> and we're not. But we think, oh, that sounds good, you know. <laughs> so then we start to work towards it. Do you think we could do that with other people? You mean? I mean, not, not in a... Um, false like lying way but you know praise them oh you're so patient and then I mean incite that kind of reaction within them I think I've seen people do that before it's like how do you praise without it becoming flattery because flattery is yeah that's true but it would be interesting I mean obviously we're not (laughs) on that (laughs) level or station yet but it would be interesting to do this kind of encouragement Mm. to get people to develop their virtues maybe instead of being uh, oh you know you could work on your kindness a bit you can (laughs) instead (laughs) straight like (laughs) i mean praise them for it and say okay you know and then perhaps create that kind of image Mm. within them the other person and be like oh Maybe I am like this. Maybe I can be like this. If a child is, is taking its first steps and it falls over and then you say, oh, you're an awful walker, <laughs> you know, like... Just stop. And try again. It'll just lose the confidence and it won't want to stand up again. Yeah. But if you say, oh, yeah, you're a very good walker, you know, it'll get that confidence. It'll try to stand up yeah. even if it's fallen over. So I think we have to do that with people. If they if they make the attempt, I suppose we can pray yeah. them for it. But if they're just... They're not trying, then I don't think we just, like... They're being cruel and you say, oh, you're so So kind. (laughs) 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 Then they just get an askewed idea of what kindness is. Yeah. But I think it would be an interesting thing to try out or like just raise your awareness, maybe even start looking at people and see like, okay, what kind of virtues is this person showing? Mm -hmm. What can I praise or what can I see in this person? Mm -hmm. Because we're also supposed to see, you know, the good in people, Mm -hmm. even if they have nine bad qualities we're supposed to see that one good quality so Mm -hmm. kind of training ourselves into how 
to see good in people. And I think praising them for it is another step. Because, I mean, if you think to yourself, okay, every day I'm going to see one good thing in someone and praise them for it, it will actually like raise your awareness of it. And hopefully, I mean, you're, you're, you will be keener in seeing these things in people. And I think that's one of the things that's probably missing in the world today, mm -hmm. this whole encouragement and seeing the good in other people. Like we're not, we're not the cause of these grand spiritual anthems being chanted. Mm. You know, it's mm. it comes from it comes from God and then moves through us. But if it wasn't for that that animating force, it wouldn't be happening at all. Mm -hmm. mm. It's like if we're, I mean, wandering and lost then the goal comes, we're walking towards that goal. But the goal doesn't come because we're walking towards it. The goal is what's causing us to walk towards yeah. it. Hmm. Could it be because, maybe that's interesting, like there, there, there was, I mean, before the revelation of Baha'u'llah, as Abdu'l Baha is saying, I mean, we were kind of lost, so to say. So he comes again and sets the standards. Mm. Um, and sets the target for us. And in that way, we know what we're reaching for and what we're striving for. And maybe this is why the renewal is required every couple hundred of years or so, that mankind goes on its own ways. And then after a while, we start, you know, aimlessly wandering around. And then there's a need for a manifestation of God to say, okay, this is the direction you're going. This is, these are your goals and this is what you're striving for. So this is a talk that, like, it talks about everything, kind of, from, you know, the people in California, to the revelation of God, to peace, to acquiring human virtues. I wonder how the people who heard it actually reacted to it. Those Californians? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you go and you're like, whoa, mind blown? Or is it so much, so overwhelming that you just don't grasp any of it? Mm -hmm. Or do you just cling to like one thing is like, oh, I understood this. I'm going to take it out and kind of, okay, try and remember that or work on it or mm -hmm. study it more. Yeah, each, each you know, sentence in this talk is is a drop in an ocean of wisdom and then this whole talk is just another drop in the bigger ocean of wisdom. <laughs> like, you'd sit here forever and just discuss, you know. I feel like at the time there would be things that you could pick out that would be easy to relate to. Like, I feel like the idea of, you know, not having a national identity that you're attached to, um, where he says, I'm, you know, I'm not just a Persian. You don't, like, choose one. I feel like that's something that could really speak to a lot of people um, at that time, especially in California. Um, but I think that sort of the way that this all connects is really profound because it does all connect. That's it for our podcast this week. Special thanks to Jim Traub for playing Thornton Chase and Amy Marks for playing a California community member. Also thanks to our reader and roundtable guests, Ariana Hakiman, Mitch Doran, Anna Castellez, and Borna Safai. If you'd like more information about Abdul Baha's travels in the West, visit our site, www.thejourneywest.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at The Journey West. Thanks, everyone. Bye.